Gary Stearman, it is time for another daily update from Prophecy in the News. It happens to be Tuesday, the 20th of March. Hope you're having a great day. I'm in studio today with Bob Ulrich, and we're going to talk about one of our favorite subjects. Bob, we, we're doing a program on this, which will be released a little later, but today a little preview of rapture and resurrection. Our favorite subject. It is our favorite subject. And of course, the rapture is a resurrection, isn't it? It is. And in fact, this is something that I've discovered. You know, semantics can trip you up every time. And uh, we, we get tripped up on our words. For example, uh, rapture of the church, rapture of the church, catching away of the church, uh, pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. You can begin to play with terms like that, and after a while your head is spinning. So why not come back to, to the single term, resurrection? You know, the church is going to be resurrected, Bob, all on one day, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the entire church, the body of Christ, will be resurrected. Now, you could give it another name, like rapture, or catching away, but hey, what it really is, is resurrection. Well, you left out pre-wrath, you left out partial <laughs> rapture, you left out I second did. coming, you <laughs> left out the apostasy, you left out all those terms that tend to confuse us. Yeah. But you know, the more I think about it and the more I look at the rapture, I've been reading this book by uh, uh, Professor Olander, mm -hmm. The Greatness of the Rapture. And he's a Greek scholar, and he has the advantage that I don't have. And when I read his book, I'm finding things in there that I never knew before, and I'm fairly well read when it comes to the subject of the rapture of the church. But he breaks it down using the Greek language into mm -hmm. something that it's kind of hard to deny when you actually see the crystal clarity of it as he points it out. Well, you know, the book uh, could scare you away. Uh, you say Greek scholar, professor of Greek at Tyndale, and I think your first reaction would, uh-oh, that's going to be too highfalutin for me to read, but actually he has a very clear way of presenting things, you know, numerical sequences, first, second, and third, and I mean he's just very clear. Well, I like the way he uses the footnotes. He, he explains it in very easy to understand language, and then the whole bottom page of each page are these footnotes where he goes into the Greek language and shows yeah. the alphabet and shows the word structure and at the sentence structure, and it just really adds a lot to the study. Speaking of adding a lot to the study, you've written in the April magazine this article, Rapture and Resurrection, mm -hmm. about eight pages long. And you talk about, you know, a lot of people think the rapture is this new concept that was invented in the 1830s by, right. you know, this charismatic woman and C.I. Schofield picked up the ball and ran with it and the, and the whole church is in a state of mass confusion. <coughs> and I think what you've written in this article couldn't be any clearer because it explains this, the types of rapture in the Bible and how following this catching away and whether it's mm -hmm. the rapture of the church or the resurrection of Jesus or the, the rapture of Elijah or the two witnesses and all these things you build into the articles, you always talk about after this catching away is a period of judgment. And that just struck me as just really highly significant. Yeah, you know? in, in every case. Uh, uh, the, and there are seven archetypes of the rapture in Scripture, and what a wonderful number that is, by the way. Uh, wherever you have the number seven, you have the complete statement of God's will concerning man. And so we have seven archetypes of the rapture. And the interesting thing is, these seven archetypes all involve a resurrection, but different types of resurrections, beginning with the number one example, which is Enoch. And uh, Enoch's resurrection is very famous. <clears throat> Excuse me. He walked with God. He was not, for God took him. He was resurrected. <laughs> he, he was taken to eternal life, and he didn't have to die. Is there a better picture of the rapture of the church than Enoch? No better picture at all. Talk about a perfect resurrection. Now, we don't understand exactly why Enoch was resurrected, there's not that much of an explanation given. He was an extremely righteous man. He walked with God. He left this earth alive, and he's still alive today, and he wrote a book. And that book is a prophecy of the latter days, days which have not even been fulfilled yet. 
over 5,000 years ago he wrote that's, that book. And, of correct. course, you and J.R. covered that in, in laborious detail, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and just brought things out that, that people have no real understanding. You know, we look at the characters in the Bible, and a few weeks ago you and I had a conversation about how God uses even wicked men for his purpose. Uh, even men that we believe were you know, sincere men of God, like King David. I mean, yes. you could call King David a murderer. Uh, King Solomon, an idolater, and you go through all of the different flaws of all these men in the Bible. Why are those characters the one ones brought out in the Bible and not others? So when you say why God chose Enoch, maybe he chose Enoch to give us a picture of the rapture of the church early in the scripture. Early, early on, I think to demonstrate the possibility of resurrection. Uh, and he chose one man to do that, but that was not the only man. Uh, we have to return to the simple idea that humanity is under a death sentence. Mm. The only cure for it is resurrection to eternal life, and the only way that's possible is through uh, the risen Christ, who is also an archetype of resurrection and rapture. Well, he's number four on the archetype list. Who's number two? Number two is uh, Moses. And Moses, uh, interestingly enough, died at 120, but he was still a young man. That is to say, you might have looked at him and said, wow, this guy's about 21 years old. I don't think he looked that old. The Bible says that none of his natural force was abated. He had communed with God, and something of the energy of God had bled over into his body. And so when he went up to Mount Nebo to be buried, and by the way, God buried him with his own hands. He was not like every other man. He was not ready to die. And I think he was taken up into a condition, and by the way, this is Jewish history, the Jews believe he was taken up into a condition that we would call uh, something like suspended animation. And that he later uh, revived, because we see him in the New Testament with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. So we know that he didn't die in the conventional sense well, the whole story of Moses, I mean, whoever heard of Jehovah burying you personally? Moses obviously was chosen, unique man for a unique point in time. He was in the presence of God on Mount Sinai when he came down from the mountain. You needed to have a veil to even look at him. I mean, he was shining. I don't know if that continued for the rest of his life, but obviously when, when God took Moses and, as the <coughs> Scripture says, he buried him, uh, he had a future plan for Moses. And... Again, Moses being the great deliverer and the great prophet is example number two of resurrection and rapture. Example number three is Elijah, and that's just clear as crystal because we read that Elijah did what God wanted him to do and then was taken aloft in a fiery chariot alive. He never died, and he's alive to this very day because Scripture teaches that he will uh, come back to Israel before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Malachi talks about that. Uh, we find uh, one of the two witnesses in uh, the book of Revelation surely must be Elijah because he withholds the rain for three and a half years. Mm. You know, Flavius Josephus talks about Moses being caught up in a cloud, that there yes. were witnesses, and he wrote about this. And, of course, Elijah was also caught up in a cloud into heaven. And you know that cloud is seen everywhere. If Even when you go back to uh, the first case, the case of Enoch, you discover that Enoch was taken aloft, uh, according to his own book, in something that he called a flying house. But it was more like an energy cluster, uh, I guess you'd say, or, or a cloud, an illuminated cloud. So in every case, and we're not going to have time today to talk about all seven cases, we find that these people who are resurrected are taken aloft in a cloud. Even Jesus was taken aloft in a cloud, as was recorded in Acts chapter 1. Well, there are several parts of the story that maybe we can finish in the near future here. Well, we're going to come back tomorrow and talk some more about this. The subject is rapture, but most of all, resurrection. Gary Stearman, wishing you a great day in the Lord. By the way, things are happening in the Middle East, and it uh, doesn't look like it could be too long. Keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>